Hey there, have you ever heard of the Bajol people? They're a unique group of nomads who've lived off the coast of Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines for centuries. What makes them so fascinating is that they've lived in the middle of the ocean outside the borders of any state, which means they're not recognized by any government and have no citizenship or rights to live on land. Instead, they gather in communities, sometimes on tiny islands, to hone their maritime hunting skills that have been passed down from generation to generation for over a thousand years. The Bajol people live on small houseboats and typically only come ashore to trade or find shelter. However, their impressive abilities extend far beyond the water's surface. These sea nomads are renowned for their exceptional free diving skills, which they use to hunt and survive using traditional techniques. They spend up to eight hours a day underwater, diving up to 230 feet deep with only a wooden mask or goggles and a weight belt. The Bajal people are incredibly comfortable underwater, walking on the seabed with complete control over their breathing and body and catching fish with ease. It's all about adaptations. Humans have a reaction that's triggered by holding their breath and being submerged in water. Your heart rate slows down, the blood vessels in your extremities get smaller to conserve oxygenated blood for your vital organs, and then your spleen contracts. The spleen is a reservoir for oxygenated red blood cells, so when it contracts, it gives you an oxygen boost. It's like a biological built-in scuba tank. Meanwhile, the Bajol, who are inextricably linked to water, have managed to grow a spleen larger than other people. When I say larger, I mean larger by 50%. Not just the Bajol who dive regularly have an enlarged spleen, even those who don't have a spleen larger than average. This increase is therefore believed by some not to just be a consequence of regular diving, but something that emerged as a result of evolution. According to researchers, the Bajol diverged from their closest non-diving relatives about 15,000 years ago. That was enough time, apparently, to adapt to life on the water, and sometimes the Bajol also rocked to their eardrums at an early age, make diving easier. Just to be clear, please don't try that at home. So, isn't that amazing? The Bajau are truly unique and their ability to survive and thrive in the ocean is a testament to the power of human adaptation. Not only do they live a unique lifestyle, but recent genetic studies suggest that they may hold the key to understanding how the human body reacts to extreme conditions. You see, certain diseases such as strokes and heart attacks deprive the body of oxygen, but the genetic adaptations that allow the Bajau to survive underwater for long periods of time may inspire new ways to protect people on land. This is similar to how scientists are studying the genes of people in Tibet and Ethiopia who live at high altitudes. When you or I climb to a high altitude, our bodies immediately start objecting to such treatment. We get out of breath and may even experience altitude sickness. In response, our bodies start producing more red blood cells to compensate for the lack of oxygen. However, since we aren't adapted to the high-altitude environment, our body's reaction can be maladaptive. We produce too many red blood cells, making our blood thicker than it needs to be, which increases the risk of high blood pressure and stroke. But the people of Tibet don't experience these same problems. Thanks to their special adaptation, they produce fewer red blood cells when they climb to higher altitudes. Apparently, this adaptation can be traced back to a gene inherited from an extinct human species, the Denisovans. When our ancestors interbred with the Denisovans, some of their DNA apparently ended up in various Asian populations, including Tibetans. Then, when modern Tibetans moved to higher altitudes where the inherited gene was activated, so-called natural selection came into play, ensuring their survival. Some believe that 87% of Tibetans today have the Denisovan gene. So, studying the Bajau and other groups with unique adaptations to extreme environments can provide valuable insights into how our bodies function and how we can better protect ourselves from diseases. Who knew that studying sea nomads and high-altitude dwellers could have such a profound impact on modern medicine? It's incredible to think, at least as believed by some, that our planet was home to a diverse array of human species and eventually we were left with just Homo sapiens. How did we become the humans we are today? It's been a mystery that scientists and anthropologists have been trying to solve for centuries. Recent research suggests that all modern humans descended from a small group of African pioneers who left the continent in our prehistory. 
This group was apparently adapted to life on the tropical savanna but encountered many challenges during their migration. Extreme temperatures, new diseases, and encounters with other human groups such as Neanderthals and Denisovans apparently posed a threat. However, scientists believe that our ancestors interbred with these groups and acquired DNA from those who were already adapted to life on new continents, and with each new generation they were then better adapted to the new conditions. Speaking of adaptations, have you heard of the Sherpas? They're members of a Nepalese ethnic group known for their extraordinary ability to climb at high altitudes. They've even set records in speed climbing routes no one else has dared to attempt. What makes them so successful at conquering any height? Recent studies suggest it's their ability to harness oxygen better than anyone else at altitudes above 1.5 miles. Oxygen levels become very low at high altitudes and can cause a range of problems for those who aren't used to such thin air. Sherpas, like Tibetan people, produce fewer red blood cells at higher altitudes, but their muscles are also apparently built differently than those of people living on the plains. They can turn more oxygen into energy, giving them an edge in high-altitude climbing. As far as diets go, have you ever considered what it would be like to live off a diet almost devoid of plants? That's the reality of the Inuit, who live in remote Arctic regions. Their diet is extremely low in plants, but high in fats from fish and mammals. It's not something we could adopt easily, as our blood vessels could be likely for begging for mercy. However, the Inuit have long adapted to this way of life and have several unique gene variants, according to scientists, responsible for fatty acid metabolism. These supposed mutations protect them against cardiovascular disease and diabetes, and even have a significant effect on growth. It's fascinating to see how different human groups have adapted to extreme conditions and challenges. From the pioneers who left Africa to the Sherpas and the Inuit, our bodies seem to have adapted in amazing ways to survive and thrive. Imagine living on a diet of just meat and fat. Seems impossible, right? Well, not for the Inuit people. Apparently, they have genetic mutations that allow them to thrive on this limited diet. This adaptation has been beneficial for them for at least 20,000 years, and it may have helped the groups of people adapt to a hunter-gatherer diet as well. It's an example of how adaptation works. If you got to eat walrus, it has to make sure that it benefits your body. So what about the rest of us who are not Inuit? How can we survive without fruits and vegetables? Take vitamin A, for example, which is vital for our eyes and bodies. The urban population gets it from colorful plant foods like carrots, but vitamin A is also abundant in the fats of cold water fish and marine mammals, as well as animal liver. Vitamin D stimulates bone growth and is also found in these foods. People living in temperate and tropical climates usually get this vitamin through sunlight and cow's milk. Now, what about vitamin C? Its source in the diet of northern peoples has long been a mystery. If we don't have enough of this vitamin, we could get scurvy, a terrible connective tissue disease. Turns out vitamin C can also be obtained from animal foods like raw caribou livers, seal brains, and raw kelp. These foods contain very little vitamin C, but still enough to prevent a deadly disease. We've talked about those who live on the water and under it. We've seen those who were able to settle high in the mountains, or even those who've adapted to the harsh north climate. But have you ever heard of the Korowa tribe? These are the only known group of people on Earth who settle in tree houses. It may seem uncomfortable to live more than 100 feet high in a tree, but for them it makes perfect sense. The area where they live is prone to floods and has a high number of insects, making it a dangerous place to live. So they started building houses in the trees which originally served as protection against attacks from rival clans seeking to capture people for slavery or even cannibalism. For centuries, the Korowa people upheld the traditional belief that their deceased ancestors could return to the land of the living at any time. So they built these dwellings high above the ground to protect themselves from evil spirits. In short, a treehouse protects against everything. These houses take just a couple of weeks to build and the Korowa don't use helmets or other protective equipment. Maybe it's all about some adaptation that helps them climb and not fall? Alas, no one has studied the tribe from that angle, so we can't say if they're different in terms of physiology. But there's another example, the Tua people. They are hunter-gatherers who live in the rainforest of southwestern Uganda and regularly climb trees in search of food. They are remarkable climbers, capable of climbing high into the tops of trees without ropes to collect honey. 
Researchers filmed these people to study the biomechanics of their amazing climbing abilities and found out that the tour could bend their ankles to the limit, bringing their shins closer to the tree. This is roughly what wild chimps do. In most humans, this kind of ankle flexing can cause injury or bone fracture, but the tour have longer fibers in their calf muscles, resulting in a simply phenomenal talent for climbing. Maybe the Korowa possess a similar quality. So, we've talked about how different groups of people have adapted to their environments in unique and amazing ways. It's fascinating to see how humans can thrive in so many conditions, from the harsh north to the rainforest. Let me tell you about a group of people known as the Mokan, who live in the island archipelagos of the Andaman Sea and along the west coast of Thailand. These small tribes, also known as sea nomads, spend most of their day diving for food in the sea. What's amazing is that their children have an incredible ability to see underwater, almost twice as well as European children. Now, to see well on land, you need to be able to refract light that enters your eye into your retina. But when the eye is immersed in water, which has about the same density as the cornea, we lose the cornea's refractive power and the image becomes severely blurred. However, Mokan children can constrict their pupils and change the shape of their lens just like seals and dolphins to see underwater clearly. It's not a genetic anomaly, though, because scientists have found that European children can attain the same underwater acuity as Mokan children through training sessions. It's just a matter of habit. However, the only difference is that European children have red eyes due to the salt in the water, which is not observed in Mokan children. Speaking of vision, did you know that some Aboriginal people in the Australian outback can have more than four times sharper vision than non-Indigenous people? They can see things that are four times smaller than what most people can see. It's an ability crucial for survival, especially for a hunter-gatherer who needs to find food and water. Perhaps it was their sharp eyesight that made the Aborigines such good astronomers. Knowledge of constellations was part of their culture and has been passed down from generation to generation. In fact, there's evidence that hints of astronomy being practiced in this region thousands of years before Stonehenge was built. When modern explorers studied the records of the 1840s, which contained Aboriginal descriptions of constellations, they couldn't figure them out. It wasn't until scientists picked up binoculars that they discovered the missing stars same stars that Aborigines could see with their naked eyes. Isn't it fascinating how different cultures have adapted to their environments over time? It's incredible to see what the human body is capable of.